welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Ruth Langer, and just give me a wave if you're hearing me on this on Zoom. Yes, good. Thank you. Uh, we're working out the technology quirks here. Uh, my name is Ruth Langer, and I am the interim director of the Center for Christian Jewish Learning here at Boston College. Uh, I wanted to welcome all of you uh, on Zoom and a few of us in person to the first of three lunchtime discussions on reading the New Testament of new insights from the Jewish Christian dialogue to be offered by our Corcoran visiting chair, uh, Dr. Jesper Svartvik. And this week's topic is Jesus the Jew and his Christian followers. In this talk, which we originally conceived as an in-person intimate conversation over lunch, it's being conducted in hybrid fashion with many more people from around the world joining us by Zoom. Some of you are visible on the screen in this room, so if you do not want to be visible, uh, you're free to turn your camera off, but you, we'd also quite happy to have your, your smiling faces uh, joining us here. For those of you on Zoom, please do keep yourselves muted and use the chat to post questions. We are monitoring the chat and uh, we'll be sure to relay your questions to Dr. Svartvik. I do want to include uh, official thanks to those incl uh, included in that we, uh, Dr. Camille Markey, our center's associate director, and our technical assistant, my graduate student, uh, Sam Jai. This event is being recorded in speaker view, uh, which we encourage you to use as well so that you can see the speaker bigger. Uh, and it will be publicly available on our website and social media shortly. Now to our speaker, whom many of you know. Maybe somebody should shut the door. Uh, Jesper Svartvik holds a doctorate in New Testament studies from Lund University, where he held the Christopher Stendhal Chair of Theology of Religions. His areas of expertise include New Testament studies, interreligious relations in general, and Jewish-Christian relations in particular. Dr. Svartvik is the single author of 12 books and co-editor of four more, most of which focus on or have significant implications for issues raised by Christian Jewish dialogue. So, yes, for the floor is yours. I will turn my sound off. Thank you, Ruth. So, welcome to the first of three lunch talks hosted by the Center for Christian Jewish Learning at Boston College. These three lectures are given during a pandemic. For the last two years, we've constantly been reminded of the importance of washing our hands, remembering that what goes out of our mouth can be dangerous and indeed extremely contagious. In addition, given that this series is given at lunchtime in Boston, dinner time in Europe and as well, about brunch time in California, it seemed natural to choose a pericope in the synoptic tradition that contains an enigmatic statement on what goes in and what goes out of the mouth, found in Mark chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 15. There's a third reason as well for choosing this pericope. In addition to the pandemic, and that it is about lunchtime now in Boston, and that is that this text has been a cornerstone in the theology of those who have presented Jesus of Nazareth as not only more or less critical towards some contemporary interpretations of the scripture, but fundamentally anti-Jewish, anti-halachic, anti-nomistic in his teaching. Indeed, we have numerous theological texts that present his entire mission, Kur Deus Homo, as Anselm would have said, as a solution to the problem that the Jewish interpretations of the Hebrew scriptures and therefore Judaism constitute. Now, this is a lot to chew on, especially at lunchtime. So therefore, let's go directly to the pericope. And as I said, Mark 7, Matthew 15. And I suggest that those who listen to the recorded version, you take a short break now, pause my talk, read the two texts before continuing to listen to my presentation. This text is often referred to as one of the clearest indications that Jesus opposed the Jewish food rule, rules, uh, known as kashrut. 
not only the emerging Jewish interpretations of the law, the oral tradition in the New Testament called the traditions of the elders. It's mentioned in this pericope, Mark 7, 3 and 5, and Matthew 5, 2, parabosis ton presbyteron in Greek. But even the law itself, since the dietary laws are described in the Torah, in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, although they are specified in later texts, for example, the commandment not to mix milk and meat. Now, the Jewish way of living in antiquity, Shabbat, Brit Hamila, Kashrut, Sabbath, circumcision, and uh, food laws, they were and they are important parts of the Jewish identity. And I'm inclined to argue that the person in antiquity who was consistently indifferent or even explicitly, blatantly negative in all these three respects would not, by the surrounding, be considered Jewish. So therefore, this text touches upon a number of interesting, important issues. The central statement in the is the enigmatic word of Jesus by the evangelist, uh, the gospel author called a parabole, often translated as parable into English, but here more likely an enigmatic statement. Verse 15 in Mark, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. Or verse 11 in Matthew, it is not what comes out into the mouth that makes a man unclean, but goes out of the mouth to defile the man. Now, the most obvious difference between the two Gospels is that the Messian version emphasizes that it was goes out of the mouth, ectostomatos, or into the mouth, estostoma, that defiles the person. And that difference in wordings will prove to be highly significant. When we seek to understand this statement in order to ascertain the teaching of the historical Jesus in his Jewish context, we need to pose two questions. And that's basically what I do in this lunch talk. How did then contemporary Judaism look upon what comes out of the mouth? And what did then contemporary Judaism say about what goes into the mouth? That's the content of this lunch talk. Even a cursory reading of rabbinic text makes it obvious that Amoraic rabbis look very seriously at Lashon Hara, the evil tongue. Uh, and that is what comes out of the mouth. The Jewish tradition has specified 613 commandments in the Torah, of which 365 are positive commandments, thou shalt, and 248 prohibitions, thou shalt not. And of these 613 commandments, three are considered particularly important. The prohibitions against shedding of innocent blood, shichut tamim, illicit sexual relations, for example, incest, giloya rayot, and idolatry, abu dazara. And these three are sometimes called the cardinal sins, or in Hebrew, mitzvot shel yahareg ve'al ya'avo, commandments for which one should allow oneself to be killed in order not to transgress them. So now in order to persuade people not to commit lashon hara, the sin of evil speech, there was a tradition that stated that evil speech is serious, and not only as serious as three cardinal sins, but even as the three cardinal sins altogether, Keneged Kulam, we have this in Tosefta uh, Pea 1 2, which dates, I would say, from the third century, perhaps the beginning of third century. It becomes even more remarkable when this statement is combined with a list of three important injunction uh, uh, commandments to honor one's parent, to show generosity and to work for peace among people. And then comes the conclusion, and studying the Torah is as important as all these three together, Keneged Kulam. So the, these two lists of three commandments and the summary uh, become mirror images of each other. The opposites of the three cardinal sins are three great commandments, and the opposite of evil speech is a study of the scriptures. And I assume that the underlying idea is that those who study Torah, the scriptures, let the words of scripture go in through eyes and ears, as we know, listening and not only reading is important in antiquity, and that those who commit Lashon Hara, who say bad things, how bad mouth people, they abuse what goes out through their mouths. Now, it should perhaps be pointed out that the purpose of such statements is not to diminish the seriousness of shedding innocent blood, 
Instead, it's about treating evil worlds as if, ka'ilu in Hebrew, as if they were as serious as murder. One should thus regard them as murder with words. Rabbinic, the rabbinic tradition says that someone who makes another person blush in public, it is ka'ilu, as if it were murder. And in the Sermon on the Mount, it's stated that if one insults a brother, or a sister, it is as if ke'ilu in Hebrew, if he has murdered that person. Now, since the expression Lashon Hara cannot be found in the Torah, the rabbis had to reach this conclusion indirectly. And the biblical text that turned out to be especially important in this endeavor is Numbers 12, in which it stated that Miriam, with Aaron's help, but the verb is in the feminine, so therefore a feminine singular, so therefore her role is emphasized here. She blamed, with the help of Aaron, uh, Moses for marrying a Kushite woman. However, this seems to be a pretext for something else, as it is stated in the second verse, Miriam and Aaron said, but the verb is in the feminine, Miriam emphasized, is Moses the only one to whom the Lord speaks? Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has, not, has God not spoken through us also? Hence, the real reason seems to be that there was a power struggle between the siblings. And as we know, the, the sibling motif occurs frequently in the book of Genesis. And here we see it's also important in the narratives about the Exodus. Miriam and Aaron also wanted to lead the people. And the text informs us that Miriam, because she slandered Moses, suffered from something called sarat in Hebrew, a term we traditionally translate with the word leprosy. However, there is no indication that it really was what we would call leprosy, Hansel's disease. For the rabbis, this turned out to be uh, an important uh, agadic metaphor connected especially to Dashon Hara, Metzora, Mosi Shemra, to bring out the, the, uh, an evil name. So it seems to me that it was the statement in Deuteronomy 24.9 that helped the rabbis to see how to apply Numbers 12. The readers of the Torah are urged to remember in particular what happened in the wilderness. Quote, remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on your journey out of Egypt, end of quote. So since Sarah made a person ritually impure, the rabbis could, by combining all these texts, thus create a chain that urged people to be aware of the destructive powers of evil speech. A. Evil speech is associated with sarat. B. Sarat renders a person impure. C. Hence, evil speech defiles a person. Now, in order to avoid misunderstanding, I may have to clarify one thing here. Rabbinic Judaism did not argue, suggest that evil speech made a person ritually impure, de facto. If that were the case, there would have been actual purification rituals in the rabbinic text for those who committed Lashon Hara, and we don't have that. So since this is not, uh, we, we don't have such a, a ritual, we can say with certainty that this is another form of impurity. And I would call it, it is an agadic one and not the halachic one. It's not halachic impurity, it's an agadic one. And the purpose of the rabbis was to persuade their flock, if I may use such a word, to use the tongue in a certain way, or rather to dissuade them from using it in a destructive way. So it's time now in this lunch talk to summarize what's been said so far. First, in the rabbinic text, there is a technical term for evil speech, la shonara. Secondly, the rabbis considered the abuse of the tongue to be a very serious violation. There are even texts that go as far as to say that evil speech is considered as serious all three cardinal sins, Kunegit Kulam, all together. And thirdly, the rabbinical interpretation of Leviticus 12, or maybe it's Numbers 12, about Miriam's accusation of Moses made it clear that they believed that there was a connection between Lashon Hara and Sarah, between evil speech and this mystical disease. Uh, that they state uh, that actually defiles. And fourthly, I might add that it's significant that evil speech occurs when there is a power struggle. And that reminds me of the text in Mark 7 and Matthew 15.
Now, all this makes it possible to draw the important conclusion that evil speech, what comes out of the mouth, in a certain sense, make a person impure, even though it is what I call agadic impurity, not halachic. And for me, it's quite obvious that it is in this context that the parabolic statement in Matthew 15 and Mark 57 should be interpreted. That's half the lunch talk. Now, the next step is to examine as carefully as possible what Judaism at the time of Jesus thought about what goes into the mouth of a person. So how were the biblical texts on impurity and forbidden foods interpreted? Kashrut, the Jewish dietary rules, define permitted and forbidden foods respectively. And since the words pure, tahor, impure, tameh are used, it's necessary to pay attention to the different forms of purity and impurity. They are used in different contexts. A number of unsubstantiated claims, even among biblical scholars, about the laws of purity are circulating. The most common are these two. A, that sin and impurity are not differentiated, that some claim that it was a sin to become impure. And B, the rules of purity were used by the religious elite to oppress the weakest in society. First, so it's crucial to realize that Judaism in antiquity distinguished between ritual and moral impurity. It was no sin to become ritually unclean, impure. On the contrary, it was one of the basic conditions of life that one was ritually impure at certain times in life. And it's therefore, I think, unfortunate that the words unclean, uncleanness had become so negatively charged because some of the most important events in a person's life caused him or her to become ritually impure. Impurity arose, for example, at the conception, birth, and death of a human being. And many would probably argue that few things are more important than honoring one's parents by burying them. But since burying a person meant that one becomes impure, it was, in antiquity, sometimes honorable and a duty to become ritually impure. And there are many more examples that overturn these common misconceptions. Indications that impurity is not negative per se by definition are that sacred objects, a prayer capsule, tefillin, and a Torah scroll are unclean. If scripture defiles, how could it be altogether negative? The rabbinical question, does this text defile one's hands, can therefore, in a free but faithful interpretation, translation, be reformulated as, is this a text that is canonical, sacred, and binding? So that is what they mean when they say, is this text uh, a text that defiles one's hands? There is such a discussion about, for example, Shir HaShirin, the Song of Songs. What then should be said about the second statement, the claim that the purity regulations were a way for the elite, the religious elite, to marginalize the poorest? Well, ironically, even a cursory reading of the purity rules in the, the Torah, in the rabbinic literature, is enough to make us realize that no one had more laws of purity to follow than the priests. So the conclusion we must draw are thus first, it was not wrong to be ritually impure during certain periods in life. And secondly, that the number of rules for a group in society may well be a sign of a certain status in society. But the basic rule seems to be that the higher up in society, the more rules you have to follow. So I wanted to establish now, ritual impurity was in antiquity inevitable. And secondly, not identical with sin. And three, it's something that's temporary. Sometimes you're impure, sometimes you're pure. However, moral impurity is something completely different from ritual impurity. The acts that I mentioned, more than others, cause moral impurity, which is, I would say, an agadic uh, figure. It's an agadic language. It had to do with agada and not with halacha. It causes moral impurity, uh, uh, for example, the shedding of innocent blood and idolatry. <clears throat> now, these three acts that I referred to are described as abominations, to evot, singular to eva, and should always be avoided, always. And you see the difference here between moral impurity and ritual impurity. Ritual impurity disappeared after purification, 
but there is no purification ritual in the world that would nullify moral impurity. You can read the Torah as many times as you wish. You won't find uh, that you go to a mikveh after murdering a person. So that's why we need to see this distinction. The cardinal sin should always be avoided. Ritual impurity was a transient nature. Moral impurity accumulated, as it says in prophetic literature, and its ultimate consequence was the gap between the people and God became so great that the presence of God, Shekhinah, left the temple or left the people. Now, it remains to examine a third category, namely the food laws, Kashrut which I believe is neither moral impurity nor ritual impurity. Those laws described in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, and then uh, developed in rabbinic literature. The words impure impurity appear also in these texts about kashrut, but how do food rules relate to ritual and moral impurity? On the one hand, it can easily be stated that the food rules laws are not identical with ritual impurity. Since ritual impurity occurs during a limited period of time, and water and waiting are the criteria for leaving the state of impurity in order to become impure, to become pure. The food rules, on the other hand, must always be observed. In addition, ritual impurity was associated with the temple, which means that when impure, one could not participate in the temple service. And when the temple fell in year 70 C, therefore, Many of the purity rules lost significance. And an example, an indication of this, uh, is that in the Talmud, we have Gemara, the commentary to the oldest part of the um, Talmud. We have commentaries only on Nida, because most of the purity laws were not applicable when there was no temple. So the food rules, laws, on the other hand, they are of great importance. They were in antiquity and they are still for many Jews uh, all over the world. So kashrut, it cannot be compared to the three uh, cardinal sins, as I call them here, and uh, such as murder, for example. And this means that the food rules are uh, tertium genus. They form a third group. And all these three groups are related to each other uh, because of the terminology, ritual impurity, moral impurity, and kashrut. But they are not identical. And if we try to, to make them identical, we misunderstand the text from antiquity. They are different, so they must be kept apart, although they are overlapping because of the terminology. The food regulations, the food laws, should be understood primarily as signs of the covenant reminiscent of the covenant between God of Israel and the Israel, Israel of God. I'll quote from Leviticus uh, 20. I am the Lord your God. I have separated, hivdalti you from the people. So you shall therefore make a distinction, uh, the hivdalten, between the clean and unclean animals and between the unclean birds and the clean. You shall not bring abomination on yourselves by animal or by bird or by anything with which the ground seems, which I have set apart, hivdalti, for you to hold clean. You should be holy, ktushim to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, kadosh, and I have separated the avdil, you from the other peoples, to be mine. All this was a quotation from Leviticus 20, verses 24 to 26. So, as you see several times in this text, central text, it's emphasized that God has separated Israel for a special task, for a special mission, so to speak, and that Israel therefore must distinguish between permissible, pure, and forbidden, impure foods. Kashrut is thus covenantally, theologically motivated. Israel should refrain from certain foods, not because it's dirty in a sanitary sense, not because it's harmful to health, but primarily because the food laws serve as a reminder of Israel's vocation. And it's important now to realize the difference between the adjective impure, tame, and the verb to make impure, which has to do with the laws of uh, purity. In other words, not everything that's forbidden to eat is impure, and not everything that's impure is always forbidden. The question is how many are the forbidden food dishes in combination that actually defile? 
Now, the Jewish tradition says that the person that eats forbidden vegetarian foods, something that have, comes from a year that when you shouldn't um, pick it from, uh, from the fields, does something that's incorrect. But as far as I know, that person does not become ritually impure. The person that mixes mix in, uh, meat and milk violates a simple part of the laws of Kashrut, but the person does not become ritually impure. Someone who eats forbidden seafood acts wrongly, but does not become ritually impure. So impurity has more to do with shita as the criterion, the way that land animals are slaughtered, than by the kashrut laws per se. So it has more to do with blood than with the entire area of kashrut. That's how I see it. In other words, in most cases, it's not because it's defiling that it would be defiling that food is impure, i.e. forbidden. It's forbidden, uh, and it's, it's called impure, but it's not impure in the same way as the, uh, as the adjective is used when we're talking about ritual impurity. Now, returning to Mark 7 and Matthew 15, what then is the key issue in this pericope that we have in two Gospels? The most plausible answer, I would say, is that those who came to Jesus they went down from Jerusalem to the Galilee, came to Jesus and his disciples, thought that everyone without exception, even those who did not have to do so according to the traditional interpretation of the scripture, should treat ordinary food as sacred food, that is, as if it were food eaten in the temple. They wanted to turn every meal into a sacred temple meal. They wanted everyone to live as if they were priests in the temple. The discussion in this case is that's not about food regulations, food laws, kashrut in general, but about whether rules that earlier only were applicable for priests in the temple now also should be followed by everyone. That this is the most plausible interpretation is evident in the conclusion, in Matthean, Matthean version. It says, quote, but to eat without washing your hands, that does not defile a person. End of quote. Matthew 15, verse 20. It's important to note that this conclusion responds to the question in the beginning of the pericope, so why do Jesus' disciples eat bread without washing their hands? Verse 2 in Mark, verse 2 in Matthew. That's the question, and it answered. The answer comes in Matthew 15, towards the end. The question, therefore, concerns the self-imposed purity regulation, not food laws in general, not kashrut. There are many arguments against the most common, common interpretation of the statement in Mark 7.15, in Matthew 5.11. And I believe it's much more reasonable to see the statement as an assessment of the importance of two valid things. Firstly, what goes into a person, permissible, impermissible food, and partly what goes out of a person, constructive or destructive speech, Lashon Hara. Now, the purpose of the statement is therefore, I believe, that even more important, uh, it is even more important to think about what goes out of the mouth than what goes in through the mouth. When the statement is presented in this way, we understand that the protagonist in the Gospels wanted to convey that even more important than thinking about what goes in through the mouth is to think about what goes out of the mouth. If the case were, as so many often say, that Jesus here abrogates parts of the Torah, a meaningful comparison cannot take place. Why should anyone compare something that's obviously important, what goes out of the mouth, with something which is considered to be completely unimportant, what goes in through the mouth? So it's therefore much more reasonable to conclude that the first part of Jesus' statement in Mark 7.15 Matthew 15, 11, is about whether ordinary food should be regarded as temple, if whether temple regulation apply to ordinary food. And the second part suggests that improper speech should be called impure speech. In other words, when those who came from Jerusalem reprimanded the disciples for not keeping their far-reaching interpretation of the scripture, which goes beyond the Torah, they are rebuked by Jesus. And I would like to suggest the following words are written between the lines. This will sum up this very long uh, and rather technical uh, presentation. So this is what's written between the lines. Why do you slander my disciples? And that's also me. 
why do you insinuate that I do not keep the law? Remember that there is an even greater sin to speak evil, ill of others than to keep your additional interpretations of the rules of purity. I say unto you, it's not so much the things which enter into the mouth that defile a person, it's much more what goes out of the mouth that makes a person impure. Remember what the Lord our God did to Miriam on our way out of Egypt. It's not there, it's not in any manuscript we have, but I believe it's, it's written between the lines in the text. Many Christian Bible commentators have argued that the statement in uh, Mark and Matthew is anti-halachic, antinomistic. A book that I read when I was a student, written by Edward Schweitzer, uh, he uses the following drastic words to describe the purpose of, of Mark 7, uh, 1 to 23. What's primarily important to Mark is this absurd Jewish legalism and Jesus' victory over it, a victory which is evident to everyone. So Edward Schweitzer understands it as an anti-halachic argument, and therefore he can refute uh, everything that has to do with Kashrut because it's absurd and it's evident to everyone. However, this uh, statement going in and going out is used also in Jewish sources. So I would like to give you three examples now. The first one is from a book by Isidor Grunfeld, a classical book on Jewish dietary laws published 1982. And he says, quote, there's therefore no greater fallacy than the old saying taken from non-Jewish sources and we understand what we're talking about here, so it's the New Testament. There's no greater fallacy than the old saying taken from non-Jewish sources, but so often quoted also by Jews who wish to defend their disloyalty to the dietary laws. It is not what cometh into the mouth of man to defileth, but what cometh out of it. So he knows that this is a statement from the New Testament. He thinks of it as an anti-halachic statement, and therefore he refutes the refutation that we have in the statement. However, the first time I uh, addressed this issue many years ago, and there was something new uh, in terms of technology called the internet. So I Googled, but we didn't do in that in those days. I think I Alta Vista. And I found an Orthodox, Jewish Orthodox website in Seattle where there was a story, and it refers to this statement, but the, the people who wrote that text did not think of it, did not know that it was a, a text in the New Testament, but rather as a part of the collective Jewish memory. So this is the story, and you'll see how perfectly it fits at the Orthodox Jewish website. They reached this group of people, they reached a small wayside inn run by a Jew, and here they stopped. Not knowing the owner, the Hasidim asked for a dairy supper. I'm terribly sorry, the innkeeper apologized. I have nothing dairy to serve you. I can only offer meat. The Hasidim began cross-examining him. Who is your shochet who has slaughtered, uh, who is the butcher? Who certified him to slaughter? Does anyone inspect his knives periodically? Who cashed the meat, etc., etc., etc.? Suddenly, a voice was heard from the corner. Everyone looked and saw a shabbily dressed man sitting behind the stove. Hasidim, he said. You have no end to your questions. You wish to make sure that every singular particular is perfectly kosher. You are, and now it comes, you are so careful and meticulous about what goes into your mouth. Tell me, are you also as careful about what comes out of your mouth? This is an Orthodox, Jewish Orthodox website in Seattle in the year 2000. In the same year, there was an interview with Joseph Tlushkin in Hadassah magazine. And he talks about the importance of Lashon Hara. And this is what he said in that interview. Somehow the term religious became exclusively connected with ritual, he says. If someone eats non-kosher, no one would call him a religious Jew. But if he speaks Lashon Hara, or is otherwise unethical, yet performs all the rituals, we do. And that gives the impression that ethics are an extracurricular activity. I want to restore ethics to its central place in Judaism. So I gave you three Jewish examples in addition to Edward Schweitzer's commentary to Mark. And these three, Isidor Grunfeld, thought that he was anti-halachic, so therefore he refutes the reputation. The second one didn't know that it was a, a quotation 
or a reference to the New Testament, and therefore they included it in a story about Chassidim, about the Wayside Inn. And the third one speaks explicitly about Lashon Hara, and I would say it's very close to uh, the topic in Mark 7 and Matthew 15. Jorge Borges, the Latin American author, is known for many things, and he wrote in an essay, the fact is that each writer creates his precursors. Their work modifies our conception of the past just as it is bound to modify the future. And I would like to conclude with this reflection. So if this statement in Mark 7, Matthew 15, if that goes all the way back to the teaching of the historical Jesus, I would say that it is best understood as a statement which compares two valid aspects. It thereby emphasizes that avoiding evil speech is even more important than observing food laws and um, uh, purity law. Not suggesting, however, that they be replaced. New Testament scholars often talk about ipsissima verba Jesu, and I refer uh, often to the ipsissima struttura Jesu. We can't find the exact wording, but I'm looking for a, a, a original context, struttura. And I think that the ongoing discussion of contaminated food and contaminating speech, la shonara, that's the topic, at least in Matthew, and arguably could go all the way back to the historical Jesus. Sooner or later, students of the saying, Mark 7, Matthew 15, they stand at the crossroads. They have to decide whether this parabolic statement is part of the ipsissima struttura Jesu, whether it's an awkward halachic statement, cleansing all foods, or it's a credible agadic instruction, a warning of the perils of evil speech. And now I return to Jorge Borges. He says that writers create their precursors. And when Matthew wrote his 15th chapter, he also created Mark's seventh chapter, although that gospel was written more a decade earlier. The antinomistic features of the Mark and Jesus were brought into relief by Matthew, when in his version of the same pericope, he presents a law-abiding protagonist. Matthew was instrumental in drawing attention to his Mark and forerunner. How else? How else should we explain the strange fact that for almost two millennia, people have read about Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospel of Matthew, but interpreted him according to Mark? Thank you. Uh, so, no, I So, Margaret, can you get me, Margaret Shepard, can you get me away from hearing me? Wait, great, great, thank you. Uh, so, um, first thing, thank you so much, Esther, this is wonderful. And uh, I say that as someone who wrote a masterpiece on the Shonara, on evil speech and even Judaism. So, uh, something which I find bringing that voice to my past. So the ways that then also integrating it uh, beautifully into. Uh, an understanding of what might actually have been going in the gospel. So thank you so much for this. I do want to remind uh, Margaret's place in the chat. My voice is breaking up. Um, better if I speak loud, more loudly. Uh, do you want to remind people to who are on Zoom to? Ask questions in the chat so that we can relay them to the expert. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. And for those of you in the room, are more than welcome to raise your hand. And if I don't see that, it's going to be way, way harder. Um, let's start with a question um, from Lawrence Edwards. Uh, Burton Edwards suggests. These passages can, and I would say should, be read as part of an ongoing conversation. Jesus is ideologically close to the Pharisees and debates or discusses with them in terms of both ritual and ethical categories. We want to develop that thought because it's like something which is, which is very much part of this book. So thank you. Yes, I agree. There were uh, a number of 
uh, Jewish groups, Second Temple Judaism, and if we compare them, uh, I would say that the, the Jesus movement, if we call it that, uh, was uh, closest to the Pharisaic movement. And as many of you know, uh, that the Luke and Paul in Acts defines himself as a Pharisee. He says when he talks to the son at Bin, I'm here because I believe in the resurrection of the dead, which was a very typical Pharisaic thing to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the Sadducees who did not believe in that. So uh, that, that's the short answer to a very interesting question. Yes, uh, when we compare all these groups, uh, he, he seems to be much closer to the Pharisaic movement. Many years ago, there was a book called the, uh, published called uh, Jesus the Pharisee. Uh, we have a question from Peter Roth, who is uh, on campus is around the corner in the next room. Um, it's striking in the market account, of course, a parenthetical comment when we give the list of some of them in verse 3 and 4, chapter 7, and 93, which Matthew, assuming market priority, ignores. It seems to me that the market and the fan understanding of the issues in view are different. Could it be that Mark, at least to a certain extent, Mark is at least to a certain extent anti halakhic and understanding that Matthew rejects as incorrect? In other words, we perhaps already have a debate within the Synoptic Gospels concerning the interpretation and implication of a certain Jesus tradition. Thank you, Dieter, for a very good question. And the short answer is yes. So a book that Dieter and I often read is the synopsis of the four Gospels. It's a very interesting book. It compares the, the Gospels. And um, one example is that Mark 7, it says, Moses said, and Matthew replaces that with, uh, and God said. So he, he emphasizes that it's not only Moses, this is the word of God. Uh, so I agree that Matthew brings uh, Jesus closer to an inner halachic conversation. And we often say that, I mean, I'm not saying this to Dieter, and Dieter and I were saying this together because we, we both uh, teach New Testament, that um, uh, Matthew discerns, M Matthew has a clearer, uh, uh, he, he, he knows how to express things so it, 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 it makes sense in an inner Jewish context. Whereas Mark is reaching out, for example, he interprets when something is said in Aramaic, he has to interpret, he has to translate it into Greek because uh, people didn't have, the, his readers didn't have that knowledge. So I agree that we have a discussion going on within the synoptic tradition. And that's why I ended with a Jorge Borges quotation that Matthew has been read so much more than Mark we know that Matthew has been read more than, prayed more than Luke when um, scribes wrote uh, our father, the prayer in Luke. They uh, very often by mistake uh, wrote the words from Matthew. So we know that they prayed according to Matthew even when they were writing the gospel according to Luke. And this is another example that uh, all those scholars now uh, know that most scholars argue that Mark is the oldest gospel. We still read Matthew, but we have interpreted Matthew according to Mark. So that's why I think that Jorge Borges is correct here, that, that uh, one, when one writes a text, one creates one's precursor. So when Matthew emphasizes that Jesus is within the boundaries of halachic Judaism, uh, that the mock and antinomistic features uh, are emphasized. So thank you, Dieter, for that uh, important question. Around the corner. Uh, so a question from Sam, you wanted to say something? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, thank you very much for your fascinating lecture. Uh, I'm just wondering more about Kashrut as an element that's different from ritual purity or moral righteousness. Uh, this idea fascinates me because it's always, uh, it's often difficult for Christians to approach something like Kashrut to understand it as theology because Christians may think, well, not many Jews have written about it theologically, right? Um, for example, uh, 
know, if they meet in milk, like uh, kind of, um, how do you um, understand this as about theology? What kind of theology? Because for Christians, they would think, well, this is a moral teaching, um, but also Marx feels uh, you know, ambiguous, but how can Christians understand the kingdom with more depth? Like the way you did with Daniel, uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, I'm thinking of this old book uh, describing the differences between Halakha and Haggadah. Bialik Bialik, uh, wrote it uh, on uh, Halakha. Uh, yearns for unity. Uh, Agada longs for pluralism. So just to compare equal to equal, halakha is about knowing uh, what to do, when to do, uh, how to do it, how much, how little. The uh, answers to all those questions, that's uh, halakha. A, a way of T.S. Eliot says, the, uh, life is not a religion, is not a so much a way of talking as a way of walking. So it's interesting that both halakha and sharia has to do with a practical way of walking, as sharia is the way to the water, uh, old Bedouin uh, language, and, and we have something similar here. So I think it's important to, to not to compare um, two different topics here. So. Uh, kashrut is halakha, ritual impurity is halakha, whereas lashon hara is for me is in the sphere of agada. So that's why they can they can drag in, they can they can refer to uh, impurity, but it's not halakha in the sense that ritual impurity was in antiquity. So so therefore, when you say theology, I think that the, the so to speak. Jewish word for it would be agada, and there you have uh, uh, it, it. As I said, it longs for, it yearns for pluralism. So there is no one answer to the question why. Why do we keep the mitzvot? Why why is Shabbat important? Uh, two Jews, three answers, etc. But halacha uh, looks for this unity. So so I said that not very. Not, not a very distinct answer, but that, that's uh, how I look upon it. That you, if you want to know more about what you call theology, you should look um, at uh, the Midrashim and the, the Agadah, and that's where you find this. But but one should be careful not to say that this is what Judaism teaches, because there are many rationales for avoiding lashon hara, uh, and I mention a few of them. Uh, so, so they have this pluralism. They enjoy uh, having a number of opinions here. So it's, theology means different ways of talking about God. Thank you. I see that Richard Robertson has raised a hand on Zoom. And I'm going to invite you to try to unmute and we can uh, see whether we'll hear you. Yes, hello. Um, I, I miss. So so I'll mute this one. No, no. no. I, I believe you. You. It's I'm unmuted. Exciting. You know. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so my, my question. Um, are you? Are you, you? We can't see your face. So. Uh, um. Sure. I'll. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll turn. I'm not hearing. Yes. Yeah, yes. Hello. Um, my question to you, Jesper, is. Hey. Um, how but much we're not hearing you. So if you could put it in the chat, we're, we're not set up. We have feedback problems at the end. Okay. Um, so David Mayan writes, uh, certainly the root term and its impurity and hurrah are used in different contexts in the Hebrew Bible. The distinctions of ritual um, the distinctions of ritual impurity, halachic and agotic, and the separation of the moral sense 
sins in completion with the status of ritual impurity, which is sometimes either natural or unavoidable, or even the result of disgust, such as the example of bearing one's deceased relative. What should we make of the Bible nonetheless using the same term in these various contexts? In addition to verses such as Ezekiel 36, 17, which seem to equate moral impurity with impurity in the midst of it. Thoughts? Um, so thank you. Uh, I agree that I mean, they, we are talking about uh, one set of words, uh, pure, impure, impurity, purity, etc. Uh, and the verbs are important, pure, um, something that makes impure and makes makes a person pure. Um, a set of words together, and they are used in all these um, ways, and I try to, to make it oversimplifying it, perhaps, ritual impurity, moral impurity, and Tasha was saying that they are combined because of the language. But it's true, of course, uh, in uh, ancient Judaism, in many uh, cultures uh, all over the world, that there is also a connection between what you call impure, not only it's a, a neutral thing, as I, I referred to that, sometimes in life you are impure, and that's not a sin, you are doing what you're supposed to do, you're burying your father, for example. So you, you will be impure, and that meant only that you were not expected to go to the temple because you were impure. It says it's that, that two sides to that, that coin. But uh, as, um, as you say in your, your question, there is also a spillover effect that you, if you talk about something uh, uh, that is impure or makes a person impure, that that, that also becomes uh, something that you, uh, you, you avoid because you, you, uh, you think of it as uh, not desirable. So we have it in ancient Judaism and we have it in many other uh, cultures as well. So I, I, I agree, thank you. And I think we have more questions about the complexity of this interface. Um, so Lawrence Edwards writes, in later rabbinic tradition, Lashon Hara is very much a matter of halakha. In fact, I was wondering, speaking for myself, I was wondering whether the text that you were citing, the Hasidic tale, was coming from the context of this discussion of Lashon Hara, uh, that was mostly associated with a family of the Hasidic Chaim, uh, who's um, blanking on his, on his real name, uh, but who wrote a book based on the name, of the, uh, his name is based on the verse uh, that he's most about Lashon Hara in the Torah, who is the Gitom? Who is the person who desires life? That's what they tell you. Keep your tongue from evil. That's yes. the origin of this, yes. of this word. Um, so the Prophet Sain writes this whole book on the laws of of Lashon Um And so, how how does this play out with moral impurity? Actual ritual impurity and this discussion of Palakana Adada seems to be getting muddled in a lot of ways. And it's also related, thank you, thank you, Ruth. It's also related to the $10,000 question about how do we, in what way can we refer to, uh, uh, rely on uh, later rabbinic text when interpreting the New Testament. So what I tried to do here to see uh, to, to make a trajectory from the Hebrew Bible, we have the paradigmatic text uh, of Miriam in the desert. We also have the text in Deuteronomy, which plays an important role in the Siddur, uh, that remember what happened to Miriam. And those two texts do something together. And we have in uh, Mark, maybe, but in Matthew, for sure, I would say a reference with the Shonara. Then we have a few statements in the um, Tanaitic text. I mentioned Tosefta Pea, which is an early text, the, the, uh, as early as it can be when we're talking about rabbinic text. And then we have numerous texts in the Amoraic literature that's a bit later, and uh, I mean in the Midrashim, etc. So, what do we do? when we're talking about uh, 
the New Testament texts, they are from the first century, uh, Mark uh, 70, Matthew perhaps 80, 90, and we have rabbinic texts that are perhaps from the third century. So one thing is, uh, one option is to do absolutely nothing. You say you don't refer to rabbinic texts because they are later, which makes that you, you don't give Jesus of Nazareth the chance to be in a Jewish because you don't refer to anything that has to do with Judaism. Or you try to do what I try to do in this presentation, that you, you do this trajectory. You see, we have texts in the Hebrew Bible. They don't mention Lashon Hara. We have uh, Lashon Sheker, perhaps. Uh, we, we have um, in the wisdom literature admonitions about this. We have in the Greek texts, we have uh, uh, this concept. And I think that the Agadic figure, with the help of Matthew, can be predated. So since we have it in Matthew, and eventually we also have it in the Tosefta text, I think that Matthew should not be seen uh, as something completely different, but part of this trajectory. So I can't see why Matthew would change going in, going out of a person into eistostoma, ectostomatos, using stoma, the word ma, if he didn't think of this agadic figure so I know this is thin ice, but but nevertheless, I think that it, for me it's quite clear that Matthew's redaction of the marking material is proof for uh, uh, that we can predate Lashon Hara. And at the very minimum, it's a fascinating opening to a discussion of moral halakha right. and, and ways that Jewish concerns overlap with things that are very central to Jesus' teachings yeah. Yeah. And, and the way that they are carried forward in Christian ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think we are out of time, but I want to thank you very, very much Esther, for a fascinating discussion. I want to remind everybody that the next talk in this series will be March 15th, uh, same time, same place, maybe more people in person, we'll see. Uh, and the third, uh, that will be on Paul of Tarsus among Jews and Gentiles. Uh, there was a question sent in in advance that was relevant to that, so we'll hold it until then. And uh, then the third on April 19th, it will be during Passover itself, actually. Um, the epistle to the Hebrews for, or to the evil to Hebrews for against them. So thank you all very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you, if not before then, uh, on March 15th. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.